well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and um, say how happy I am to be here. And uh, so, uh, Javier told me this should be a actually, mini course. We like to go to the grad students, and so, and that's what uh, I'm going to do and how I designed this. So, um, so there'll be three lectures on it. So today will be. My intention today is to start presenting whatever you know that I made in, in the crash course on the regular topology. So in one hour I'm going to know everything you want to know about the regular topology. So, but it will be the idea is to try to make you see all objects from a different perspective at least. And that will motivate what comes in the last lecture when I try to explain uh, what about motivic complexes and his approach to motivic homology. And the second talk will be a hybrid <coughs> between the theory topological and this more algebraic, and there will be some ingredients coming from differential geometry where we really employ some, some objects that we there to represent cohomology from its, a different perspective. That will tie into um, things that we try to the joint link with James that we presented in the last in the last. Uh, in my talk in the conference. So, but then, so as I said today, I mean, please, the, the algebraic topologist is in the room for you for the first half an hour. But um, the idea is that we're going to talk about revisiting, revisiting. So, this is part one. I'm going to be oh, revisiting polymeric homology. So, <coughs> And so let me, so when I write top, I mean the uh, topological spaces. When I write top star, the category of spaces with the base point. So the category of base spaces. And so let me introduce some notation here. So, um, so if you have two basic base spaces, then you can take this mass product um, it's just the result of taking the product and dividing and smashing. So in, in particular, we can talk about, um, so when you, when you smash the circles, you have a sphere S2, etc. And this is actually very innocuous statement is a good exercise. I hope you have not seen this. If you, if you have key copies of the search and you smash them, you get a sphere SP. And a lot of what we're going to be discussing, in some sense, revolves around the, the sphere and what we can do with, with spheres. And in particular, this, this presentation will bear relevance to what comes next in algebraic geometry. So, um, now let me let me recall how you define single cohomology. So very briefly, the idea is that and, and, and what I want to do is to, to bring this idea that you, you live in the world of topological spaces, and then you send topological spaces to another category, and you set a homological algebra there. So I'm giving category. So let's see. <laughs> but now next um, in my next lecture, I'm going to do the same, but with a different category from what we're used to. So, um, but so the idea is that you start with the top with the topological spaces, right? And so you have this space here, and then you look at the so the thing. This is this is a, a simplicio set, but where sing sub n of x is simply the set of all maps from delta from the simplex to x, the collection of all such maps. Um, and then, of course, you look at the free abelian group on it. This is a simplicia abelian group. And then anytime you have a simplicia abelian group, whatever that is, you can take the alternating sum of the, the faces and then you, you get what we're used to, which is the, the singular complex. 
the single complex of X. But now I want to see a single complex as, as, a, as a cohomological complex graded in negative degree. So in other words, I have here 0, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so I have my C0 of x here, C1 of x, and I have this the usual differentials that you have, but I, I want to see them all graded in negative degrees, so the grades go up. So for me, everything goes, you know, the, the, all, all the complexes are, are, are the homological complexes. So, if, but now you think about the look at the let's call K O M, the category of complexes of abelian groups, and let's think about in, in this world you have a notion of homotopy of complexes. Uh, so, so you have a homotopy of maps of complex. So you have a homotopy category uh, of of complexes of abelian groups or complexes in any abelian category, and so you have a so we end up getting a functor from here to here. Right, that, that's the that's the similar complex functor. Now let me give you an object that lives in this category. For example, so uh, another notation. So if you start with a complex A, and by A I mean something that and I actually I want this category this let's think about complexes that are bounded above, maybe. So in other words, a goes something like this, this is a n goes a n plus one goes a n plus two and it, it stops at some point and then if you have such a complex then you have r which is an integer right james already used this in his talk but i'm just reminding what that means this is shifting of complex by r so this is another complex but now the j a building group in this complex is the R plus J complex in the previous complex. I'm just shifting the complex depending on what R is. In particular, in particular, it's supposed to be two words that I just put together. So in particular, if you have Z, for example, or an abelian group, so let's say if you have let's say Z. Z is an abelian group concentrated in degree zero. We can see always any group as a complex of groups where you have zero goes to z goes to zero, 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 zero. This is a complex. Successive differentials, when you compose, you get zero. So I see this concentrated in degree zero, degree one, degree two, number five. And so if I have, for example, R greater than zero, I can look at this complex, and now I look at ZR. And how do you see this ZR? Where is this concentrated at? The quiz. So when I look at the J element here, is the previous one at degree R plus J? So this is going to be zero when J <coughs> is different from minus R and Z when J is equal to R. So this is concentrated in minus R, goes all the way to the left. And so now I'm going to tell you how, as an exercise, show that single cohomology, say from say x, say with coefficients in z, is the same as you look at in the world of homotopic, um, the homotopic category of complexes. So this is the same thing as maps, the homotopic category of complexes between this complex and this complex. Oh, uh, okay, so what's the lesson learned here? Is that I, I, I started to talk about the spaces, I placed it in the homotopic category of complexes. Right, so uh, now you have to check the literature, what does it mean? But basically the, the, the objects are complexes um, and, and maps are homotopic classes of maps of complexes, all the differentials commute, etc. And you use just that definition and this is follows immediately from what you know. And, so, and you can replace Z, Z by any abelian group concentrated in the, the visual, and that follows. 
but now the homotopy category of complex, if I replace this complex by something that homotopy equivalent to it, like a weak homotopy equivalent to it, I still get the same result. Right? So this, this homotopy <coughs> It's just given as homomorphism. So let me give another example of such a thing. <clears throat> let me give another example. And that brings us back to spheres again. So for example, if you have, you know, you have an augmentation, so you, you have your C, C1 of X, so this is, goes to C0 of X, and C0 of X, I can think about it, it, it goes to Z, just a degree, because C0 of X is just, an element here is just a, almost sum like these are points in X, and I send to the sum of an I. And let's look at the kernel of this. So we define C star T of X as just the kernel of this map of complexes, what I call of, of C star of X to Z. So it's the same thing in every, you know, except in the last one, I get a, a, a thing to degree zero. And now claim, <coughs> I can give a map of complexes, this is this the map from say ZR to this thing, and now I put this sphere S R. This is smash product S1 to S1 R times. And if you forget about this and you compute the homology of this complex, what do you get? If you get the reduced homology of your sphere, which means you just get Z in dimension R and zero at elsewhere. Correct? So therefore this and so basically you just look at one cycle that represents the top dimension of homology here and send one to that. And that's it. I gave you a map of complex which is an isomorphism in all degrees. And so these two complexes are logical there. Quasi isomorphic. There's a map from this complex to this complex inducing an isomorphism in homology. In the homology complex. Remember I I, wanna, uh, I, I see everything as a co-chain complex. So everything goes up. So in particular, consequence, so this is induces an isomorphism in homology. So the complex, the, the all single chains in X, this is something huge, much, much bigger than this, in some sense. But in terms of homological terms, they are the same. They represent the same thing. So, and then this implies that, for example, if I want to know the, the art, homology group of your space with coefficients in Z, you know, I can certainly, I look at uh, maps, and I'm, I'm trying to avoiding the name derived category for the moment, but I could move on to the derived category. It was, this would be just maps from X to, to this. <laughs> In the derived category. Right? Because these two complexes are the same if you use this and the, the, the observation at the end, that's usual definition of if you track down the, the differentials and everything, that's the usual definition of similar cohomology. And now I'm seeing now these two things. So what are we learning from here? So yes. Oh thank you. I have to put a tutor here to get it. I, so I told that today, I would like to apologize to the audience and kill me. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the idea is that we send the objects in this world to a suitable sort of a medium category or a place where I can do some homotopy theory or some homological algebra and realize single cohomology as basically maps from this the, from the result of embedding spaces into that world and a suitable element that represents 
represents comma. And so um, now let me move on because this is supposed to be one of the first things in my notes. In general, let me go back now to the classical homotopy theoretic world, and I'll think a bit fast for now. I believe that most of you, the students, must have taken the Rebec topology class in Marcel, maybe IVR. <laughs> or, and if you did, then Aguilar. And so you know exactly what I'm going to talk about. But, um, but so now back to that to the topological world. And this, I'm, I'm introducing this form because eventually I want to also talk about equivalent versions of that. Everything I'm saying here, we're going to do say the same with the group attached to the, to the space, the spaces with the group action. And, and of course, in the last, and, but ultimately the goal is to work with one of my favorite groups besides the trivial group, which will be uh, the Galois group of C over I, a very complicated group. It's much more than you think. But, but so that would be the goal to understand equivalent cohomology for this group. It's a Z mod 2. Isomorphic to Z mod 2. Is that an easy or magic <laughs> one? Okay. So, so in here, you can talk about generalized cohomology theories. And so, and what are these and theories? Supposed to be theories over there. The idea is that you have a family for every for every n in Z, and now I emphasize Z not on the non-negative ones. You have a family of covariant functors n that sends, and then let me just put something for the moment, just to make life easier. Reduced meaning that I'm basing based space if you want to a million groups. Up to you have those funk uh, contraband funkers. Uh, uh, together with a natural transformation a natural transformation meaning that if I compose the n plus first with a suspension factor remember that suspension the suspension of a space is simply summation that space with a circle again I'm place, placing special emphasis on the circle so basically, this is say I take the n plus first homology of the suspension of a space, and I have a natural transformation from this. So let's say to the n homology of the space, the natural transformation of functors. This is just representing suspension, which one of the axioms will be this is an isomorphism for every space. Now I'm also taking the liberty of saying top for topological spaces. You can assume there are spaces with homotopic type of CW complex, and let's not worry that much about it. <laughs> but that's what it should be. And so let's see. Homotop the axioms are homotopy, variance, right? So the other one would be exactness. And the other one, what will be that? On the suspension axiom. So homotopy is that if f if you have two maps that are homotopic, map between the spaces, base maps, base homotopies, if you want, then this implies that the functors that they use are the same for all h r <coughs> y greater. Etc. Exactness, I uh, maybe I will. It's something that yields exact sequences, uh, but basically the idea is that if you have a map, uh, it's very equivalent to have saying have any map, could be for example inclusion, and then you define mapping cone 
whatever that is, that one spend time on that, then you say that you have an exact sequence. So there's a, there's a canonical inclusion of y in here. That's called j. If they pull back to the h n of y, pull back to the h n of x, then this is the exact sequence. And then from this, the usual one exact sequence in plumology follows in the standard textbooks in, um, in, in algebraic topology. Suspension means that this map, h n plus 1 of s of x to h n of x, is an anthropomorphism, the suspension induced by this, by this thing here. And so uh, these are the basic axioms. So then there is an extra additivity axiom that uh, maybe I, I shouldn't spend too much time to Hn of the one point unit of spaces, which is the co product in this world. The project, the, the inclusion of each of those factors induces a product the composition of this homology. And then the last one is also um, isotropy that if spaces have a weak homotopal equivalent, <coughs> so they have a weak homotopal equivalence, meaning something that induces and isomorphic and homotopic groups implies that they pull back um, the pullback is still in So I mean those are extra axioms but very useful in many ways. And this this is forms of what we call generalized cohomology theory. So there's a set that makes it how do you retrieve back what we started with in the previous segment, uh, if I say, okay, the dimension axiom, if I, if I add this extra axiom, if I add this dimension axiom, which is an extra axiom that says that Hn, and to, if I want to be really, really, Picky, I want to put S0 instead of the point because these are reduced theories. But so S in the zero dimension is here. This is going to be zero if n is different from zero. And then at n is equal to zero is going to be some abelian group. If you do that in the category of spaces, uh, whatever, so if, if you go uh, the complex, there's only one theory that satisfies that. It's a uniqueness axiom. If you add the dimension axiom, then you get the uniqueness statement, right? That uniquely characterizes the theory. And then if you have seen the algebraic um, spring rod axiom, then you can translate them, you can relate one to the other. There are many textbooks that do that. I guess George Whitehead's classic one does that. Was the first one to my knowledge that built on that form. So no more modern treatments and maze both them. But anyway, so this is the this is this is the axiom that makes and it should think about this as a point. Now we're gonna eventually progress to other worlds where there are more points than only one point. And that's when it becomes more interesting. So um, and so uniqueness to, to describe the dimension axiom there requires a little bit more input. So let me now, let me make a statement with a theorem. So the theorem, well, it follows from it's something called Brown, and, and this is a set of crash course. The previous segment is more important that given any such theory, right, any, any such collection of contravariant functions with all those properties, um, you can find, one can find
a collection of, and this is all, let's, let's stick to the homotopy categories of uh, spaces that are like synodic complex. You can find a collection of spaces in the same world. So let's see, E N here, where N is only greater than zero, but in, together with some structural maps. Together with a bunch of maps, let's say structural maps. This is our S. And here I want to this is the M the R sphere, the N space, and then the map to the M plus R. And they're all compatible in some sense. Compatible to homotopy. And when I say compatible, is I'm using the compatibility that you know S R smash S K is S R plus K. When you use this identification, then you will have a bunch of community diagrams that make all these things compatible, and such that and. <coughs> This is in our, this is all space, in the world of spaces. Now, if you have a map, there's a, a, an adjunction, it's a little digression. So, if the, the space of topological map, base maps, from when I smash a space X with a sp a space Y to a space Z, this is the same thing as the same as sending y the functions from x to z. Basic exercise in topology. But if you do that, then this space they have adjoints, right? They have so if you think about this as my s r, then we such that so this is called the digression. The last condition is that when I look at the adjoints, let's say the, let's say x to the head, I'm sending a map from my en to, let's say the the space. Now this is a top with compact open topology, so that write like this. But let's call it lambda r. What this is a space of base maps from the sphere. This is the R fold loop space of this space. So this is just the adjoint of this map. So this is basically is the space of base maps from the sphere S R to this. But now I put the compact to the topology. This is a continuous map, and the, I want this to be a homotopy equivalence. Okay, so this is a theorem. Um, that basically tells, I didn't tell, we can find these spaces and what the relation between this and the cohomology theory I just erased. The relation is that then satisfying um, now I say that the nth cohomology group uh, so the I think the quick way to write is that for any, for every integer R and Z, HR over space X. Let's say the limit when let's say M goes to infinity. And now look at this. These are homotopy classes of maps from the suspension of your space SM. I want to be sure that I'm going to be right of x to our space e m r. Okay, 
So of course that my r could be negative, but eventually when I'm adding them, this starts getting positive, correct? And uh, when, and what are the maps? So this is a limit, right? Limit is that you know my you know these maps they map to I can look at this suspension s m plus one of x, and here goes to my suspension s of e m plus r. But let's remember that the structural map that I start with over here send one suspension when I add the indices. And so this thing maps down to E m plus r plus 1. And I can take this left. So eventually, the fact that I'm requiring that this is a homotopy equivalence basically says that they can stop as soon as I reach the positive number here. So it doesn't matter. So, but well, I want you to now think of the similarity between what I've done before and what I'm doing now. So is that I start with a space and I have a collection of other spaces <coughs> together, the additional structure, right? So a collection of this space and this thing <coughs> and this, such that it represents that cohomology field that you start with. I'm trying to introduce this notion that yes, we can represent cohomology by sending spaces to the different category, and in that category, do the homotopy theory, and we get out the theory that we want. For yes. instance, for the singular cohomology, singular cohomology, what are these EN? Oh, oh, very good question. Actually, that's the topic of what I'm going to do next. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a very concrete model. And so I think you have not taken the course with Marcella Villa, right? <laughs> because I, I, uh, I think the whole, I mean, they had a beautiful book, like Aguilar, um, Prieto, and Hitler, where the whole approach to cohomology is based on, on this type of construction. And, uh, and that's much more in sync with, we're going to learn in the last lecture we're going to present, that's essentially, in, in spirit, what guides Wovodsky approach to the motivic cohomology of the geometry, which also um, eventually coincides with it has a multiple block I have shown which in some circumstances. So, so this is, I think, a very nice way of motivating the path to that, to that side of things. So, okay. So then let me answer your question now. So uh, how to, oh, but before I do, let me give a name to this. So um, the, a collection of spaces with those maps, right, and then if you may include this or not, you can always transform into something like that. This is called the spectrum. Um, this term was coined by actually a Brazilian mathematician called Alan Lyons Lima, but nothing to do with me, though. <laughs> okay, everybody has to be the question. So, um, this is spectrum, and that is that given any generalized cohomology theory, I get the spectrum, but using this definition, given any spectrum, I get a theory. And the properties that I listed there follow directly from certain yoga out of this picture. So now let me go back to singular cohomology. So, and the idea, and, and that's why I did things the way I did up to now, is that, but let me give one, one, one example. So an example of a theory that's not single cohomology. So for example, K theory. So in K theory, you can look at um, you can you can you can define a spectrum where the first one takes Z cross a space which is BU, and this is Z prime times BU. The way of seeing that is you take the limit over N and M in some appropriate way. You can grasp Mayan, so co-dimension N is CN plus CN. And they took inside one another by adding some subspaces to one side and then including the other and make it go up to infinity. And this is a way of constructing the E. And then I'll give another space, E1, is U. U is the infinite unitary group.
and then E2, you go back to this. And then E3, you got the picture. So it's U or zebras U, etc. And so what's interesting is that there is a map, right? So there is a, is that when you take loops on U, which is precisely loops on E1, and then this is, what the equivalent to Z cross U, and this is the main difficulty on this, it's called bot periodicity. Bot periodicity has been an incredible tool for mathematics in this last century. And then, of course, that in the loops of E2, this is loops on Z cross U, but again, you know, this is, uh, they're all based stuff, so this is connected, and so this is the same thing as loops in U. And now this is standard yoga with a classifying space of loops, in some sense. This is, this is back to you. And so, which is then our one. And, and so, and you see that this goes on and on and on and on. So what's nice, this is a theory that it has negative cohomology groups as well as positive cohomology groups. And so the even dimensional ones are what we call the K theory, and the other ones give you the suspension. And so that's, that's K theory. An example of a cohomology theory that's not the same as single cohomology. At least one you can find. And for the first no, no standard one, Atia, I guess, and I don't know what periodicity can answer that. So now, and anyway, the audience can correct me if I'm making any historical mistake here. So now let me go back. No, let me start over there. Let me go back now to this to the to the to what I had before. And so an example, so say back to to say similar formal. So now um, so let me introduce the definition. If you have X in space and again Think about a CW complex, for example. And I define Z of X is just a free abelian group, free abelian group on your space. So so far, this is just a set, which is freely generated, an abelian group freely generated by the points in our space. Let's put a topology on it. So actually, I want to put a topology where this is filtered by a collection of subspaces, so R upwards, where, and now I, I am going to be, at least this works pretty well when the space is compact, so let's start with the space compact, otherwise you take as a co-limit of those things, so let's not go into many details. But now think about this. You, you, I will take the disjoint union over all x r cross no, let's say x i cross x j. This is just the Cartesian product of x with itself. I times here, j times here, i plus j less or equal than r. And think about those are being like positive generators, negative generators, whatever for the. And then I just give a map from this to z of x. When here I have, say, x1, xi, I'll have y1, yj, and I take them to the sum of xi minus the sum of yj. Remember, this is the free abelian group generated by those things. And so the image of that, are, are you can think about things that, that have at most, can be written as at most, are generators, some with negative signs, some with positive signs. Okay? And so, and now give this, so basically the idea is that the image of that is what I call this sub x r, and contained here, give this, the image of this map here, 
the quotient topology from that, and then you start checking that the inclusion of one in the row is a, is a union of, actually in this case, compact sets that fills up your entire space. Well, that, that topology works fine with us, and then, and then the fact is that Zx is in a medium topological group, Okay. And a theorem which is looking to get a lot of things the theorem I give many you can put node and thumb and mirror and whatever you want to put together to find a quick proof for this, but that is that Define, <coughs> let's say, like z with a zero here as p. And remember, what emphasizes is the same thing as s1 slash s1 p times could be this abelian group, topological abelian group. But now I have to divide by a subgroup generated by a base point. Right? So I have. And the base point is zero on your sphere, and I just divide that. This becomes connected. Basically, this is equivalent to the connected component of this value. Make sure that they are the same. Then, z zero is an Eilenberg Maclean space. In other words, in other words, when you look at, if you want to compute the pith cohomology of your space with z coefficients, you just take on the top <coughs> classes of maps from your space to this to this thing. Homotopy classes of maps. This has a natural group structure because this is a group. So a match from this intergroup is just f pointwise is the same. That answers your question. <laughs> Not only that, if you have a different group that you have z mod p, you can really tensor this with z mod p. And then if you have a finite genetic group, you just take products of that. Otherwise, you take a direct limit of finite generated subgroups when the group's not finitely generated. Now, um, and I'm going to even sketch the proof. Of course, I won't get any details. But what I want you to do is to contrast this with the previous approach, right? which was homotopy class of maps from, from C0 of x, not C0, but C star of x, to what I call C star tilde. That's the tilde that accounts for the zero here of this here SP. And I take homotopic groups, but not in the category of complexes. Homotopic maps of complexes between these two as opposed to the spaces. So now the proof, and then I will use this to jump into the, this, this ROG graded cohomology theories, which are equivalent cohomology theories with an action, with, um, but the grading is slightly different. So the proof is the following. So step one is that for every CW complex, this thing has homotopy type of CW complex. I can prove that for anyone if you ask afterwards. Next. Um, don't on theorem. It's actually this should have a, a, a display of its own because this is really what motivates a lot of what comes next. But Dalton theorem says that if you take the homotopy group pi j of this group here, this zero here, with you know 
wave at zero, this is isomorphic to the reduced homology j of x. So this is a very, very, very beautiful theorem. <coughs> and as a consequence, so this implies that if you take x is equal to sp, then we are saying that pi j of minus z0 of sp comma 0 is isomorphic to the homology of sp reduced. So it means that it has only one non-trivial homology group, which will be z when j is equal to p, 0 when j is different from p. Now I'm going to cheat. I'll say that any space of the homotopic type of CW complex that satisfies this condition is a K Z P. So in other words, this property characterizes you uniquely up to homotopy, of course. Okay. These spaces that I'm looking for. And now of course I can give you things for the literature where you can find the details. But I wanted to really bring forth the double down here. So now what I like to do is say, okay, now I have I have covered several things. I made a basic review of generalized homology theories. I told you how to find um, how to find a space that classifies homology. Let me tell you a little bit about what about the spectrum. I said I can find a space and I can find those maps from one to the next. I didn't show you how to do that, but this is called the island bed maclean spectrum. And I'm just doing with Z. I'll simply remember that I have my A E sub P, which is the case in P, but I'm using P in notation, is just the free abelian group on your sphere S P, but more the things that are in the point. So what I want to do, I want to send a map from S1 smash EP to EP plus 1. But, but basically what I do is that I, I have, if I have a T in S1, and then what are elements here? Elements are sums of things like this, Ni, Xi, or the sum of Ni is equal to 0, for example, you can delete. And then you just send the sum of now by S I belong to the sphere S P, you send the sum of N I P smash X I. Wait, now this now belongs to the sphere S P plus one. And that's the spectrum. These are this is Z zero of S P plus one. And this is this is zero of S P. And so I do give the maps in the allen bake spectrum that you can use to classify homology fields. Now let's change gears and let's say, okay, now I want to complicate life. I want to, <coughs> I want to start with the equivalent world. And I want to somehow introduce the notion of generalized homology theories, but now I want to introduce special ones. This is not going to be only the so-called Borel homology, the homology, equivalent homology that you are very used to, but there will be um, actually generalizations in the ordinary case of things that are called Redon homology. Here, Marcel has done a lot of work on that. Um, but, but in particular cases, it extends to a, a, a um, something that's called You can take just maps to the end space. You don't need that limit because that limit are yes. like the only the only, thing, the only thing that I, I I wanted to do that is that because when you want to define a negative homology, right. 
then, then I would have to do something like, you know, I would have to take the end suspension of x and then max that to the e0. You're right, I said. Yes, you, you put the end loops on the, on the right. Yeah, I put end loops on the right, exactly. No, I, I, I agree with you, I agree with you. I, I just put the limit because then I didn't have to explain anything. But the problem is that if you the, the limit outside, <coughs> you will have trouble if your x is not fine, if your x is not compact. Sure, sure, I agree, I agree with that. And, uh, so a lot of water on the right. I thought that you have to it be very, because representability works pretty well when you're doing everything of the, you know, finite synodic complex. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this is just, I said, a crash course <laughs> with a lot of dirt stuff. But so here, now, I suppose that I, let's start with the G's, with the uh, finite group, finite group. And now I'm working with things that are spaces with an action of G, so you have G spaces. So this is the world of spaces of G action and then G epivariant maps. And all maps are maps that are. And then, you know, um, if I want to whatever, do homotopy theory, so I have to make, so homotopies like, you know, our maps between spaces, <coughs> and for every T and I, so for every T, this space is still a G map, a G epivariant. So everything now respects the action of the group. What I have in mind for the future is suppose you have a bunch of equations, polynomial equations or real coefficients, right, and then and then you look at their complex solutions, and you do know that if you have, if you find a, a solution, its complex conjugate is also a solution, right? So then the, the action of the Galois group makes that this complex solution into a space with the action of Z mod two, the action of the Galois group. As trivial as it sounds, this is really important because there are certain. Look at this. For example, let's look in projective <laughs> space. Um, in, in, so if you look at this equation, this is an equation P2, right? This is a conic in P2, and everybody says, oh yeah, sure, it looks like a projective line, right? And better than P2. Give me one real solution of that equation, projective one. So this is an example of a scheme over R that has no, no real points. So what's important, but now what differentiates that from the real, the, 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 the projective line is the, is the, the action of the group of the complex points. This is a perfectly nice scheme, but, but as a real variety, it's very different from the projective line. So that's a more commodity thing that can pick up that difference, right? so you understand that. So now, what I think about the 1970, in the, the International Cong Congress of Mathematicians, um, <clears throat> Graham Siegel made a statement that was carried through you know, several years later by, by many people, Peter May, in the school, et cetera, that, that equivalent homology theories should be greater than by the representation ring or orthogonal representation ring, the ring of orthogonal representations of your group. For example, think about a trivial group, right? So, what are the representations of the trivial group? All right, just the, the ring of representation of that. Just the integers, right? The vector space, what, what isomorphism class of vector space, because any vector space is a representation of your group. And the isomorphism class of vector space is just its dimension, an right dimension. And so the integers. And that's why the topology fields I described before, they're all graded by integers. So what does it mean? That means that this means that we have what, what is such a thing? It's a collection, is a collection of covariant functors. And now let's say H upper alpha, let me put a G over here, from the category of spaces 
right, with, with an action piece, to a vision piece, where alpha is an element that belongs to the representation of G. And so what are the axioms? Axioms, of course, it has to satisfy its contravariance, right? Um, but it has a homotopy axiom, meaning that if I have two maps that are homotopic, two homotopy like that, they induce the same map between any of these two. Now, homotopy exactness in the same way. Now, here is what becomes interesting, is what we call the suspension axiom. And again, this type of suspension in, in funny directions, as we say, appears in the in motivic homology as well, the bike layer theory. And we're going to get there probably examples of these will come up in a second lecture. But um, excuse me, I cannot understand how do you write exactness for this? I don't know because you have an order you know? Uh, well, how did I write exactness, right? Suppose you have suppose you have a map. Suppose you have a map F, equivalent map between two spaces. And then we can out of that. We also can include this in the mapping cone of that map. And I said that then for every alpha, you in the representative here, you have that H alpha of TF. You take the pullback to the H alpha of Y, you take the pullback with the H alpha, and that's the beauty of writing this way, is that I don't have to deal with alpha plus one. <laughs> for all Fs, and for all alphas, and for all maps, this is exact, exact in the middle. Now you say, okay, that's cheating. I want to know, well, how do I get an exact sequence out of it? Well, once you fix the alpha, if you want to do, say, the old classic thing, is that you can really define the cohomology for a pair, right? Say, for example, x to the subspace, and then you know goes to h alpha of x, goes to h alpha of the subspace, and then goes to h alpha plus one copy of the trivial representation, so it's a one of x a, and that's just fine. So for every alpha, we have such a long exact sequence. And that allows you to make the calculations. But that follows, that stems from this. OK, so um, all right, so I, I define, but what's suspension now? What's suspension is one of the most interesting axioms. Suspension. suspension simply says now it's, 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 it's different because so let Let B be really a real and actual be an orthogonal representation. Representation of G. Right, so in a vector space, a real vector space on, on, on which uh, G acts by by automorphism, and then the note. S upper B, actually the one point of magnification of is a sphere, this is really a sphere, but now we have embedded a group action. This group action fixes at least infinity of zero, but I have this group action on, on this sphere. So it's an equivariant space, sorry, the space with an action, denote this. Then, so we have natural transformation well now I have my represent my H G alpha composed the the, the function that smashes with my my sphere and that goes to I'm oh, sorry um, I'm the other way around In such a way that 
such such that such that when I do h alpha plus v of g of s v of your space, this is really smashing our space with a sphere. This is now a space with a g action. This is actually isomorphic with h alpha g of x. So think about this, right? Look at the, if the group is a trivial group, then representations are just an integers. So an actual representation, not the virtual one, the integer would have to have a positive dimension. I don't know any vector space with negative dimension. But then, but so that would be some sort of an Rn. And then of course when you add infinity, this is your Sn. And then you know, successive compositions of the previous statement gives you this. But now this is for all alphas and you to get these massive transformations. So I guess my time is up. But I will next I will start my next talk discussing the, this type of theories, especially the examples pertinent to us in the case where in the case where for example G is equal to Z mod two, then when you look at the orthogonal representations of Z mod two, there are only two. Irreducible ones, right? You have a trivial one, a trivial representation. So I can take any direct sum of elements like this, a copy of Z, and you have, you know, the alternating representation of the sign representation, whatever you call that, and you do like that. And this looks like, for example, complex conjugation. If you look at C, for example, the complex numbers, this is R plus IR. This part, as a representation of the Galois group, the, of Z mod 2, just one, and this is, this other representation is what I call C. So you see the complex numbers corresponds to one here and one here. And so in some sense, the alphas that I'm using here, when you deal with the Galois group of C over R, I'm just have, I'm, I'm going to have only two integers, N and P. And if you do it the right way, it will be very, they correspond exactly to the motivic N and P in, in, in motivic cohomology for real varieties. So uh, we'll continue that next time.